Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Jeffrey Zilks, thank you. Also, Alo, Tony Glass, and brand new patron, Gordon. Yay! Gordon, Gordon, Gordon. Yay! Ah, new patrons, you're the best. On this episode of DTNS, Molly Wood is here to tell us how big tech plans to responsibly power their big tech. Plus, Meta's latest text-to-video generator includes sound, and Matt Mullenweg pays 8% of his staff to leave... This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 4th, 2024, in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. <laughs> and from Spooky Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From the creepy <laughs> Bay Area, I'm Molly Wood. I am using a new mic. Uh, I'm Len Peralta from Cleveland. I'm <laughs> it's working. Len. It's working, Len. Your new mic is working. And I'm on the show's producer. I don't have any sort of uh, f- uh, a flourish to describe where I'm at. You can, you don't have to it's be spooky. spooky it's fine. I was going to yeah. say you say that, but that was kind of a little oh. bit of a flourish right there. I know you were mm-hmm. all you were also understanding about that. I was like, suck it up. It's spooky season. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, wow. Len's, Len's mic may have died right before the show, but he has rallied. Good job, yes. Len. Rallied. I've got, Good job, Len. I've got a handheld here, so we'll see how that goes. All right, let's see how it goes. Uh, we shall start with the hits that are quick. The first point upgrade to Apple's operating systems usually fixes most of the quibbles and quirks that people have with the major release. So it's worth noting that iOS 18.0.1, iPadOS 18.0.1, and macOS Sequoia 15.0.1 are all out, including rolling out a version of iPadOS 18 for M4 iPads that does not brick them because nobody wants to have an iPad bricked. So if you were having some of those reported freezes or unresponsive uh, touch screen issues, those should be fixed in this release. 9 to 5 Mac also seems to think that it has uh, sources reliable enough to report that Apple will use its own 5G modems in the next iPhone SE, which is expected to be announced after the first of the year. And Google says, you're going to make your own baseband? Well, we're going to secure ours. Uh, Google released details of updates to the firmware of the cellular baseband used in the Pixel 9. Uh, If you don't know what it is, the baseband manages your communication with the cellular network, so LTE, 5G, etc. And it can be subject to vulnerabilities, like any other software. So if it's got an exploit, it could be connecting to a false cell tower or fooled into connecting to the wrong base station, uh, accepting manipulated network packets, stuff like that. Google's mitigations include protections against buffer overflows, methods to detect and alert the system of attempts to manipulate the flow of packets, and other protections against misallocated memory. If you're into this sort of thing, Google has a whole post detailing the stack canaries and control flow integrity uh, that it is implementing. If you're not interested in what those are, just know that the Pixel 9 takes more measures to protect the phone from an attack over a cellular network. Google also appears to be experimenting with a verification system that puts blue check marks next to search results for businesses that it can guarantee are legitimate and not a copycat site, for example. The Verge noted links to Microsoft, Meta, Epic Games, Apple, Amazon, and HP. Not all accounts will see the check marks. The feature is still in testing, not being rolled out to all users at this time. Google does use its own data analysis, like site verification and merchant data, along with human reviews, to issue the verification. So if you see a check mark and hover over it, you'll get the message. Google signals suggest that this business is the business it says it is. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe it's not but we think it is. Uh, We got some more signs that we're getting near the NVIDIA 50 series GPUs as the 4090 has started to be in short supply. That's not all that surprising. We were expecting NVIDIA 50 series to come during CES, and usually the 90 series is the first they announce. Uh, WCCF Tech, though, reports that some Chinese board channel buzz claims the RTX 4080 Super is about to be in limited supply as well. And if that ends up being true, it would mean that NVIDIA might be announcing the 5090 and the 5080 series simultaneously. Like I said, an announcement is expected around CES in early January. 
The browser company's Arc Search app is now available in open beta for Android and listed in the Google Play Store. It includes a feature called Browse for Me that summarizes an answer to your search query based on web sources, archiving old tabs, blocking ads, and pop-ups by default. Previously, Arc was available on Mac, iOS, and Windows, so welcome Android users. The ability to create a short video clip from a text prompt is the hot new thing to show what your generative model is capable of these days. OpenAI's got Sora, uh, Google has Lumiere, and also Vio. Uh, there are several others, Cog Video, Runway, Pika Labs, bunch more. And now Meta has a new one called Movie Gen. It can create video clips up to 16 seconds long, which may not sound long to you, but that's actually kind of long for these sorts of things. It can add audio too. So it can create the audio to sync with the video to provide ambient sounds. If you got a beach scene, it could have ocean waves in the background. It can add mute background music too. You can also prompt from an existing still image. So they showed uh, them uh, like showing a person running and then having, or they showed a person eating a pumpkin actually. Uh, you can also edit existing video and that's the one with the person running. Uh, so you could say, put them in a dinosaur suit or give them pom poms and it'll edit the video to add those things in. Uh, apparently the videos take tens of minutes to generate and none of us <laughs> can use it because like most of these things, they are making it available internally and to select partners, which usually means like some filmmakers and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Molly, it does seem like this is, this is the new way to try to impress people on your model chops. I guess so. Yeah. Or to just sort of inspire a wave of layoffs based on the terror of this coming, but not actually make <laughs> it available to people. I mean, it's a, you know, it's, it's exactly what, so many artists and filmmakers have been worried about. It's what they struck for is protections right. against that sort of technology being abused. Uh, right now it's only 16 seconds long, so not yet. It is interesting. The idea of showing off the AI chops before there's really a pro it's sort of, I guess the fundamental question is, okay, so you're showing off your AI chops for what purpose? Is it to scare the competition is it so that when you eventually figure out what people will pay for, you're the one they're thinking of? I yeah. don't know. It's just a, it's sort of it feels an interesting. Like the second race. one is kind of a possibility, right? I guess like so. it's it's the like, ooh, that's impressive. Because when OpenAI put out Sora, it wasn't the first to do text to video, but because they are constantly impressing people, people acted as if Sora was the better one and maybe it was right but but they were like capturing the, the mind first, share arguably i mean well, right. there first, were a couple other models the before, there were a couple other models before sora they just didn't get a lot of attention right so that's that's what i think they put these out here is try try to get the buzz around your products and then people are more likely to plop down to pay for chat gpt because they think well eventually i'll be able to get sora at least i hope i will i mean I some so. of the yeah. some of this feels like okay well if it's 16 seconds long right now okay that's not a movie i mean <laughs> probably not a short film you can do in 16 seconds but you know as it gets better and it gets longer great how how many of us are going to be um, you know, uh, you know, consuming these AI generated short or even long form films, um, when that can be done by anybody with the press of a button going forward. I think some, some will, it, it almost feels more to me like this is, this is like emoji in a way. It's like it, you know, a hmm. short video that you I can make a gif. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, it helps you, you know, uh, you know, tell a joke or describe your reaction to someone else's joke or something that you can you can create that wouldn't be available to you otherwise. I mean, I have definitely been in fun text conversations that include, uh, you know, people were now making illustrations like when something is kind of funny and I want to just go to chat GPT and I like have it illustrate that thing. And then it's, sure. it is almost behaving like an emoji or, or more accurately a GIF in this case. But it, yeah, it, it, it's interesting when these demos come out because they immediately cause like a moral panic and a freak out about all the things that could go wrong. And then the company says, Oh no, don't worry. We're totally making sure that there's, you know, you won't be able to like 
turn this into a Taylor Swift porn video, which by the way, you totally will be able to do. And so, so it's, I, I wonder at what point these demos, although amazing, right? They, they show the level of, they show the speed of innovation. I mean, it is pretty insane that I think even a year ago, we never would have thought that you were going to be able to create video from text. And in fact, Sam Altman was at an event. I saw him speak in San Francisco and he was like, we're going to really slow our roll on that because it could uh-huh. go horribly wrong. You know, and like, of course they're not. But I wonder at what point these demos will start to have diminishing returns because there will be so much freak out about the capability that people will be like, maybe just just cool it. <laughs> just like, don't. Well, I don't know. Molly, Meta says it wants to, and I'll quote, quote, sort out a bunch of really important problems around safety yeah. and responsibility. They're just going to sort that out. Yeah, well, they're so on they're it. They're going to sort it out. They've done a great job with, um, you know, teenage girl mental health and political misinformation and targeted harassment and uh, housing violations and, oh, misstating their metrics so much that the entire news industry pivots to video and then loses their shirts. That I think they've done a great job happens. sorting stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> they're good uh, at sorting. Well, I, I have a feeling that these models will get better and better. And whether it's meta or somebody else, you, you will, you will see the fascination with their ability, just like we did when chat GPT first arrived, uh, kind of overtake the public imagination, which is why I think a lot of people who are covered by sag aftra and, and the other unions that are, you know, trying to put protections in are glad that they got ahead of that. Uh, sort of sort of stuff because no, no all question. this can do is make you know a gif of of me running in a dinosaur suit right now but so far yeah the the pace that these go it might even be five years before you can just generate a 60 minute video but it seems like that that would be believable that that's going to happen it's coming like i appreciate that they're letting us know it's coming and it's coming faster than we expected and at least we can try to sort stuff out because we know men is not gonna yeah uh, Facebook announced some tweaks to its design meant to appeal to younger users. We might talk about this a little more on GDI too, but uh, if you're looking and you're curious, uh, the star of the show is the new Explore tab that'll be in the middle tab at the bottom nav and collect con- content relevant to your interests. It's an algorithm. Yay! Uh, that's what everybody's been de- demanding, right? Uh, also, the video section will soon let you watch full screen videos. There's a local tab uh, to pull in marketplace groups and events. I mean, I'm a marketplace section. fan. I was going to say, that one might actually Same. be useful. Through and through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so keep an eye out for those changes. All right. So automatic. We have talked about automatic and it's it's a kerfuffle with WP Engine uh, for the better part of two weeks now. Automatic announced Thursday that some of its employees disagreed with the handling of the WP Engine dispute and were offered a severance package to walk away from the company of thirty thousand dollars or six months salary if that ended up being higher to leave the company. So 8.4% of its staff, that is 159 people, took the offer. That's a small part of the company, but it's a significant amount of people. 80% of those were in the ecosystem WordPress division. Among the departures were the head of WordPress.com, Automatic's hosting business, obviously, the head of programs and contributor experience, and Automatic's principal architect for AI. So so yes, uh, various folks may have just said, This just makes financial sense for me. I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to go to another company. Maybe I was looking for another job anyway. But some some of these, you know, you know, are executive roles. And the the idea that um, automatic and WP engine have been uh, going at it uh, for a while now has led some people to feel like the leadership at automatic is not the leadership that they want. Yeah, if you want the details on that dispute, see previous episodes of DTNS. We really don't want to go through We've it all really again. We've really gone through it, yeah. But they've, they've, they've been mean to each other in public, like saying saying not nice things, not just veiled things, like like calling each other names. Uh, and, and I could see where some people would say, you know what, I, I don't even care if you're right. Uh, I don't like the way this is done. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm a big fan of Automatic. I think what they've done with Tumblr and Auto- and Pocket Casts and, and WordPress uh, is great. 
Uh, I've always uh, sort of admired Mullenweg, although I don't really know him. Molly and I worked with him for like a hot minute at CNET when they acquired his company a while back, uh, but he wasn't there for very long, so I didn't really get to know him. Uh, but this this has made me not feel as positive about him, even though I think he has a case. Like I, I feel like I might sympathize with him more than WP Engine. I don't like the way he has been going about it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, all I can, I, I wish I had more to add other than being ugly in public and putting your employees in the middle of that yeah. is never a good look. I actually, I, I have a few um, very good friends and former colleagues that work at Automatic in various capacities right now. Um, I don't know that this is uh, striking them, um, uh, you know, personally at any point. But uh, Mullenweg said in a post, uh, which uh, he, he posted to detail that he had allowed some you know, uh, employees to go and here was their severance package and, and whatever said those that decided to leave, uh, would lose ask access to automatic the same day. They've got their own, it's called P2. It's like a, their own, um, CMS really. Um, and so, you know, you're out of there. Um, and then wouldn't be eligible to boomerang, which is the way that they describe rehiring. So if you were to leave and say, you know what, I miss it here. They say, nope. Um, at least today. So the thirty thousand dollars is sort of an attempt to just like weed out the the less loyal or the people who. To, it, I, I guess. mean, it seems like it seems like the way this is positioned is that if you take this package, which by the way it would be reasonable to do in a situation like this where there's a lot of upset and uncertainty and you don't know how the I mean look lawsuits sometimes put companies out of business right like who knows how long this could go on and what kind of resource drain it would be. It this blog post and this sort of like you will lose access immediately and you won't be eligible to be rehired mm -hmm. almost makes it feel like taking the money to leave is a loyalty test. Yeah. And I think that's the part that feels bad. Like if you're just saying, look, this could go on for a long time. We don't know what our resources are going to look like. Here's a great, you know, buyout package. That's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. If, don't go away, if you man. work here and you're <laughs> and you're feeling weird about it, like we've got our hands full. So just go. Yeah. Right. Just but go. instead, it's like, go, but know that but never don't come back. Hit you. Never yeah, right. come back. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a weird that that is what strikes me as so odd about this. Leaving aside everything else, it's basically like if you take this buyout, you're a dirty, dirty rat. Like what? It's it's know. similar to to my my feelings about this are similar to my feelings about the whole situation, which is like I kind of understand and think this might even be the right thing to do, but I don't like the way it's being done. Yeah. Uh, similar to you know like the the whole situation with WP Engine where WordPress has shut off automatic updates for them because they don't feel they're contributing enough, um, is is not necessarily unreasonable, but. It also has really bad effects in that, like, sure, they can go get those patches themselves, but that takes a lot of work to build up the ability to do uh, if you don't know it's coming. So, mm -hmm. again, maybe not the wrong thing to do, but maybe this is not the right way to do it. Uh, it seems to be the running theme with this entire situation. Ugly. Messy. And I like WordPress. We're a customer. We do, we run dailytechnewsshow.com on wordpress.com. We do. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. listen, no, if you live I, long enough, all your good guys become bad guys. I think that's the takeaway. <laughs> but do the bad guys become good guys? No, everybody just apparently reverts to oh. the mean and the mean is bad guy. It's okay. entropy. Is, yeah. Like, is there ever a bad guy <laughs> who finally became the good guy? Yeah, I don't know. I can't I mean, think there, of an example of that. I suppose there are like middling guys. Like there's like sort of the Mark Cuban move. Where people are just like, oh, now sure. he's like this, you know, really respected voice on DEI and yeah. whatever in politics and blah blah blah. But like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, the, I'm not saying Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney, but that's a little loaded. <laughs> All I'll say is it puts me in mind of the comics Irredeemable and Uncorruptible. If you haven't read them, one is about a good superhero who goes bad, and the other is about a bad superhero who goes good. So oh. maybe only in the comics, but that's the one example I can. <laughs> Uh, if you have thought about that example and you're like, oh my gosh, I must tell you, how do I get in touch with you, Tom? Uh, email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. 
So Molly recently got back from New York Climate Week, uh, where there was a lot of discussion about a lot of things, of course, but uh, particularly about big tech companies racing for energy to power their data centers. Uh, I think a lot of people have concerns about the amount of energy used in data centers. It's usually related to AI, but frankly, the amount of energy just used in a regular old data center without AI is huge. Molly, what were they talking about and what did you find out? Yeah, it's so there's been this data con, data center conversation for years and and companies especially the big tech giants who are multinational and who increasingly have, you know, their own sustainability goals or regulatory requirements around clean energy use have been doing a pretty good job of procuring and incentivizing renewable energy to power these data centers. The AI layer has created a completely different vibe. And it was so, I think that um, for the couple of months leading up to New York Climate Week, people thought like maybe it's not gonna be that busy or it's just gonna be a little bit muted, mo mostly because nobody knows what the US election is going to bring. And the, the kind of climate outcome of the election specifically is significant. So in some ways people thought this would be a climate week where people are on pause. But in fact, it was not. It was a climate week where it was like overrun. It was almost like you just had like big tech swarm climate week in search of power because oh. there is this sort of desperate race for energy to power these future data centers specifically because of AI. Like there had already been predictions that that data center power uh, consumption, which is estimated to be between one and 4% of, of global electricity usage, sort of depending on who you read, people settle right around two and a half or 3%, will hit 9% even before the sort of model training, you know, extreme increase in energy use as a result of LLMs. But so what you have seen is, you know, and it, this has been coming for a while and you can really actually, you can look at Sam Altman's history of investing in various energy projects mm -hmm. over the last like two years. Like it's, you know, Microsoft just the big news, of course, that you talked about on the show is that Microsoft is uh, entering into agreement an agreement that pending regulatory approval would reopen Three Mile Island with Microsoft as its sole customer, which is bananas. Like they're like, we're going to reopen a nuclear plant because that's how much we need power. It would reopen a new unit. There's there's currently a, a unit, unit active, but it would reopen another unit. Yeah, yeah. And as of July, I think the Wall Street Journal reported that a third of nuclear power plants were in some kind of conversation with a big tech company. Sam Altman has been investing in fusion, fission and renewables to try to secure re reliable power supply. And so it's just this. It's this fascinating conversation about how these companies will end up getting this power. Now, you know, you remember like when everybody was talking about how much energy cryptocurrency used and Bitcoin mining used, the response would always be, well, it's fine because they'll it'll incentivize more renewable mm. energy. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of that happened. But what mostly happened is that like a coal, a shuttered coal plant in Montana reopened, one in upstate New York reopened, one in, you know, a couple in Wyoming. Like they were just like wherever we can get cheap power, we're going to do it because we can't wait for the permitting and the interconnection and the building of the renewable energy. And so now there's just, I think people at Climate Week were like, it's great that you're here and what you're talking about is trying to procure clean energy and even bring, no, you know, the yes, bringing more nuclear online is controversial, but it is carbon-free power, full stop. Right, right. And that's been something that a lot of advocates have been pushing for is bringing back nuclear and not closing plants and, you know, creating new nuclear fission innovations. And it it's just this question of like, are they going to, they're going to need the power, even if this all turns out to be a bus, like they're going to overbuild as though they need all the power. Yeah, because their and projections so, say they're going to need it. They're going to go try to get it before exactly. they need it. Yeah, they're yeah, going to put out demos sense. so that you want to buy their stuff so that and then they're going to need the power to like yeah. make it all happen. But yeah, it's just a, it's a fat. And then the question is like, will they do it cleanly or will they just start buying coal? Well, if coal they energy? were showing up at climate week, you know, mm -hmm. you would, you'd be tempted to assume that that's what they want. And we've seen Amazon buy a nuclear powered data center. We, we saw Google uh, CEO Sundar Pichai tell Nikkei uh, that they're considering sourcing power from nuclear plants, Microsoft with Three Mile Island. What do you sense from actually being there? Are, are those lovely press releases or 
is it that they really are not are trying to avoid carbon emitting power sources? I think they are genuinely trying to avoid carbon emitting power sources for a couple of reasons, but most of those reasons are rules. <laughs> like mm -hmm. the like the European, you know, if you're a multinational and you're operating in Europe, you are required to have sustainability goals and net zero goals and procure renewable energy. That's just going to sure. be like the rule. And so okay. And a lot of these companies have high profile sustainability goals that are based on, you know, that their investor pressure and customer pressure and all those reasons are real. Yeah. However, economics is economics. And at the end of the day, if they're like, mm, we can quintuple in size by going all in on AI and the way that we get there is coal power from China, they're going to do it. And so and, the, it, and it only takes creates... one of them to be like, we're behind. We can't afford to catch up unless we do that. And then once one of them does that, then the others get to have cover to do it. Right. Yeah. I think it's a really I think it's a looming mm. moral hazard. And it's going to be really interesting to see if the U.S. responds in a regulatory way to clear more roadblocks to renewable energy, which everybody's already been asking for. But this but bringing nuclear back online as baseload power is kind of like an accident. And, you know, again, I recognize that it's controversial. I personally am of the opinion that we need nuclear in the mix because we can't deploy renewable fast enough and it's not, it's intermittent. Um, that all by itself is a thing that like Bitcoin promised for a really long time and all of a sudden AI has done. And mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. The, that That is the difference, right? You saw a lot of people say Bitcoin was going to need a lot of stuff. There was less need than it looked like. And they ended up just attaching to existing stuff because they didn't have the big... They didn't have the ability to go to Constellation Energy and yeah, say, we would like to, to write you a check for all the power if right. you reopen Unit 1. Yeah. I mean, um, it's just to like, just keep an eye on this space. It's I, I have a newsletter uh, that will be coming out about this. at the, So by the time you hear this show, it should be available at mollywood.co. But like, watch this space because the, the, the energy generation mm -hmm. question and conversation just got like way, way, way more interesting. This is the biggest thing happening in energy right now. And if you are the kind of person who believes in a, being part of a group that applies public pressure for things, uh, this there's going to be a lot of that around this. Uh, oh, yeah. You you can bet your bottom dollar. Your sweet Why baby. the bottom dollar? Bet, bet all of any dollar. Yeah. Some people are betting a lot of dollars on this. So many all right. dollars. <laughs> Probably too many dollars. Let's <laughs> check out the mail then. Uh, this one comes from Jeff in Knoxville, Tennessee, who writes in about CNN's latest paid tier. Jeff says, when you listed the cost, my gut reaction was this is more than my perceived value for the service. That's not to say it's overpriced in general, though. It left me wondering how to make a fair value determination. Should I compare it to a uh, streaming service and how many hours I read versus watch? Maybe it's how much I read from them versus the cost of spending time reading books. None of these feel right, but what's the right comparison? They're certainly basing the cost on their cost to produce and host the content and perhaps what they do or wish to make via ads. Since I don't know their cost or ad revenue, I can't base my decision on that. I want people paid for their work, but I don't want my view of current events to be limited by how many services I can afford to pay for. Um, well, first of all, as I always do, uh, they're probably not basing this on the cost of, of producing this, except to say they're, they don't want it to lose money. Uh, they're basing it on what they think they can get people to pay for it. And that's, that's what any business is going to do. Um, Molly, do you have any advice for Jeff on, on what, how to decide if CNN is worth three ninety nine a month? I mean, I like that, that Jeff wants to quantify it when I would argue that really it's just like, do you want it and care about it and value it. I mean, I am now paying $15 a month to be in a book group with like-minded romanticy readers, but I don't want to pay $4 a month for CNN because I already pay for all, you know, so yeah, like, right. there's, it's just your personal value thing. But I, I really want to put, I really want to note the biggest thing he said, which is that everybody had, and this has been happening for over a decade now that every service comes out and it's like, it's just five ninety nine. It's just ninety nine ninety nine, hmm. but there are hundreds of them, and yeah. and and the closest roll up we have is something like Apple News, which I'm happy to pay for at this point because I get a bunch of premium news subscriptions in it. But the idea that we're going to continue to pay for all of these things individually and have to make a service by service value determination like this 
it, it's already, we already know there's tons of fatigue. I mean, I think you just decide if you want to pay for this because you love CNN and you love like specific anchors. Well, but otherwise, I really like, like Jeff's approach to the, to the question, which is if I pay for CNN, like you said, it limits what I can pay for other things. And I don't like having my view of current events limited by how many services I can afford. Yeah. And I'm, I, it, this is tough. I know that we need a business model for journalism. I am very concerned and have been concerned for a long time about a world where quality information is only available if you can afford to pay. And the and people who cannot afford to pay get misinformation and lies. I just just this is not me arguing against anything that anyone has said, Jeff, Molly, Sarah, or otherwise. But uh, do remember that we used to get the highest quality news from a paid source, the newspaper, which was subsidized by advertising, and that radio and television news were the free ones that everyone didn't think were as valuable. Uh, the problem now is actually we have too many sources. Right. Back then you paid for the newspaper because it was the newspaper. Uh, and, and now you can pay for literally limitless number of newspapers. There, there is no limit to to what you can buy. And so it makes the decision harder. And that's, I think that's what Jeff's running into. Here. And that actually on, on that note, I, I had a conversation just recently with a friend who was saying, you know, what am I supposed to do about the, the news media business model? I pay for The New York Times and I pay for The Atlantic and I pay for The Wall, Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post and da, 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 da. And I said, hold up. Do you pay for any local news? And my personal opinion is that is when you are making your value calculation, you should pay for local news. That is where corruption gets caught early. That's where we find out quickly how bad things are in Appalachia because national news media cannot get there, but a functioning and robust local news ecosystem would be on the ground. Even exactly, even regional news, as somebody just said in the comments, like we tend to bias when we do this math toward national news sources. In fact, you need one national news source and then you should support your local and regional ecosystem because frankly, that's where the real work that matters to you day to day is being done. That's uh, your- Thanks for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. the, problem, the problem is you're, you're asking people to care about their local issues. That's, that's the problem. But they and, do. They're on next door talking about it all the time. Like that's the stuff you talk to your friends about. You know, yeah. we don't we've stopped realizing how much we care about it. We're like, where are the cops? Why are there so many potholes? This tree fell down. How come my, my community is not more resilient to climate change? It's because Lee newspapers bought all of your local papers and you don't have a reporter in town yeah. talking about the tree falling. You might not even have local news to support because of that. Yeah. Well, on that fun note, let's cheer things up and turn to Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. Len, what have you drawn for us today? Oh, what a great conversation that is. That's pretty amazing. Um, fusion energy is pretty intense, I got to say. I am uh, really <gasps> amazed by fusion energy. And uh, this is the power of the sun running these data centers. And uh, this is, yeah, so this is Doc Ock. Gosh, I didn't realize the sun wore such a cool jacket. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the sun is pretty amazing, really, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, this is Doc Ock running, you know, it's a little Spider-Man reference to uh, to the power of the sun. Anyway, if you're interested in Doc Ock, Spider-Man, and all that great stuff, you can get this at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Uh, back me at the DTNS lover level. You'll get it immediately or go to my online store, purchase it for yourself or commission me. You know, you never know. You might be able to, to get something fresh for somebody. Right. So. Fantastic. Plus I need Thank to buy so a much, new Len. mic. So. Yeah, please help <laughs> Len. He's a, this is a last minute mic he's talking into. Yeah, exactly. You need your commissions oh, now. An uh, easy sorry, value calculation to make good, there. Good <laughs> stuff, Len. Good, good hustle. Uh, good, live shows, you know, you, uh, you never know what you're going to get. Um, and Len, Len pulled it off. Um, Molly Wood, you pull it off every time you're with us. Let folks know where they can keep up with what you do. Man, you're the best. Uh, everybodyinthepool.com is the home of the, <laughs> the home of the podcast where you can see the exact same tile art over and over and over. I don't know, whatever. I'm working on that. Um, <laughs> and mollywood.co is where you can subscribe to the newsletter where you will get a weekly update when a new episode launches and uh, things like analysis of the big trends at New York Climate Week and the tech that's happening there. Fantastic. Go check it out, folks. Uh, Also, this week's top five is out. Smartphones from before 
the iPhone. Yeah, there were smartphones before the iPhone, kids. Ask your parents or watch this top five at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Picks, PIX on Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. If you're a patron, don't go anywhere. Stick around. We have the extended show, Good Day Internet, just about to start. It's time for a Friday quiz. Which city is already energy self-sufficient? Where was the first wind energy generated and the surprising country that is not Iceland that produces the most geothermal energy. Find out and play along. You can catch our show live. We do it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2800 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again on Monday with Nika Monford joining us. And we hope you all have a great weekend. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer Joe Kuntz. Producer at large Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one. BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reed. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and Jay D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias and Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Our contributors for this week's shows include Ayaz Akhtar, Chris Christensen, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Molly Wood. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>